This morning's gospel reading comes from the New Testament, the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 45 through 51. Jesus and his followers came into Jericho. As Jesus was leaving Jericho, together with his disciples and a sizable crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, Timaeus' son, was sitting beside the road. When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was there, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Many scolded him, telling him to be quiet, but he shouted even louder, Son of David, show me mercy. Jesus stopped and said, Call him forward. They called the blind man, Be encouraged, get up, he's calling you. Throwing his coat to the side, he jumped up and came to Jesus. Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Teacher, I want to see. Jesus said, go, your faith has healed you. At once he was able to see, and he began to follow Jesus on the way. That ends the reading. Lord, we come this morning in humility to hear your word for us. We pray for keen hearing, open minds and hearts. We pray for your presence with our preacher, that what we hear is your inspired word. Touch our hearts and our minds with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Today's scripture really is a continuation of last week's scripture. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. For Mark, most of Jesus' teachings, significant teaching, happens after he gets to the, to the holy city. So he's on his way. He's coming through Jericho. And there's a stark contrast in the journey that we've been talking about for the last two weeks. For the last two weeks, we've been dealing, <clears throat> excuse me, with the cost of following Jesus. When the disciples hear of the high cost, they become reticent to a degree and, and question what it means for them. The character in this story, the one we meet today, is one of those persons who's on the edge of society. Bartimaeus is a blind beggar. We met a blind man earlier in, in the Gospel of Mark, the blind man that Jesus healed back in Mark 8, verses 22 and following. That blind man is a shy person. He's brought to Jesus by some people, his friends probably. Jesus is petitioned by this man's friends to heal him, not the man himself. With an application of dirt mixed with Jesus spittle and then laying on his hands because the first application didn't work. Jesus heals the man. But Bartimaeus is not so shy and quiet. A beggar is a person who lives on the edge of charity, lives on, uh, on the edge of the community, lives on charity, the free will and the gifts of others. There were and are professional beggars who solicit alms publicly and even went door to door. There are still numerous in the East. They're usually lame, maimed, or blind. Luke 14, 13 tells us that. The commonest and most pathetic form of infirmity is blindness. Some of these blind beggars are led by children and have places to station themselves, specific places where they, live, they, they, they go every day outside the city gates. The begging was sometimes only a simple statement of poverty. I'm poor. I want a loaf of bread. Or give me the price of a loaf of bread. But occasionally they used expressive gestures of, of, of bringing the forefinger across the teeth and holding it up as proof that there was absolutely no trace of food in their mouths. 
We can read about that in Amos chapter 4, verse 6. He talks about the cleanness of teeth. A beggar was supposed to sit along the road or by the city gate and, and beg for alms. A beggar's job was to quietly remind people of their obligation to give alms to the poor, which was one of the religious laws. It was expected of Jews. It was part of your, uh, part of your uh, commitment uh, to the faith. Now the road to Jerusalem went through Jericho. Jericho in Jesus' day was a major uh, effective city. It was, in the Bible it, it is too, you know. Uh, how, do the, how do the Israelites, when they come from Egypt, when they enter the Promised Land, how do they come? They come through Jericho. And we have that Old Testament story of that. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem on his final journey to the holy city. In Jericho, he gathered a sizable crowd. We don't know much about what happened to Jericho, whether he preached or the crowds just came to him. But as he was leaving the city, this blind man named Son, that's Bar, of Timaeus, that is Bar Timaeus, heard that Jesus was there. Now, while beggars, and there were a lot of them, were supposed to remind people of their charitable obligations, they're not supposed to be demanding. Their wretched presence should be enough of a reminder. They may ask for alms, but Bartimaeus has a much different strategy. He knows that it's easy to get lost in a crowd like this. Like all marginalized people, beggars can become invisible. You know how at Christmas time, how often we pass those folks ringing bells at shopping centers, collecting for the Salvation Army? I don't know about you, but I've seen people who look down, who look away, just so they don't have to make eye contact because, you know, if we don't see them, we don't feel quite as guilty about not putting anything in the buckets. And, oh, and by the way, you know, we did that, we put that dollar in last week. Well, Bartimaeus was not about to let that happen to him. He was going to get Jesus' attention. He had probably begged in public for years. He begged for scraps and was only able to eke out a bare existence. He knew that he had almost no other options but to beg for the rest of his miserable life. Then Jesus passed his way and he was quick to recognize the wonderful opportunity afforded him. Perhaps Jesus could do for him what he was reputed to have done for others, restore his sight. Bartimaeus knew what he had to do. He didn't want to be a beggar for life. So he had to go for broke and not merely beg for a few coins or a few scraps. He had to beg for his sight. For all of his life, he was inwardly constrained to beg for his life. We too are beggars. Helpless to join eternity's procession until Jesus calls us. We're blind until Jesus restores our inward sight. We must never settle for a few coins in our hands when we can possess heaven in our hearts. You see, Bartimaeus wanted more than alms. He wanted Jesus to see him. So Bartimaeus shouted out, Son of David, show mercy. Now it's interesting to recognize that Son of David is a royal title. The king was known as the Son of David. Scholars point out that this is the first time in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is referred to by the royal name. From Jericho, Jesus is headed to his Passover. And the Passover experience in the holy city of Jerusalem is important. It's where what we know as Palm Sunday was held. The crowd will treat Jesus then like royalty. They'll lay their garments purple and they'll lay um, palm branches on the ground in front of them and hail him as the king. Hosanna, the king has come. And Bartimaeus, though blind, 
is the first to recognize Jesus' royal identity. The disciples and those following Jesus didn't recognize that. The disciples, in fact, were focused on the coming revolution. But this poor beggar, this blind man, was beyond the obvious. He sees beyond the obvious. And he knows that in this man, Jesus, the Nazarene, there is hope for him to regain his sight and his place in the community. His strategy works. And Jesus stops and directed that his followers should bring the man with a booming voice to him. When Bartimaeus arrives in front of Jesus, Jesus asks him a simple question. What do you want me to do for you? Isn't that interesting? The man is a beggar. He's blind. His whole life is given to be one of the many, one among many who moves the heart of a passerby to give him pittance. That's what beggars did. Their purpose was to beg for enough alms to get them through the day and remind those passing of their obligation to care for those who were disadvantaged. They were, be, they were, to a certain degree, representatives of those who society considered useless. They were lepers, lame, blind, missing limbs, emotionally disturbed, and even mentally ill or possessed. They were the ones swept aside. Yes, sir, this Bartimaeus guy was clear that he wanted more than this and he wanted more than his current life. When Jesus, son of David, right with Jesus, son of David, right there in front of him, he was determined to get help. He didn't just want a meal. He wanted to see. He wanted to have a normal life. He wanted to be useful. Teacher, I want to see, the blind beggar told the master. Jesus responds by healing him. But when he gives Bartimaeus sight, it's by faith. It's different than some of the other healings. There's no spitting on the eyes like the last time in chapter eight and no mud in the eye as in, chapter, in John nine. Jesus says that Bartimaeus' faith has healed him. He goes, or Jesus says, go, your faith has healed you. And Bartimaeus regained his sight and with his sight restored he didn't say, thank you, turn around and leave. No, from his deeper insight, he was compelled to follow Jesus right into Jerusalem. When we look closely, there are two kinds of sight at work in this text. They are both equally important. On the obvious side of the ledger, there's the physical sight. To be blind in Jesus' day meant a life of misery. Your life was doomed to a dark world of depending on the generosity of others to even secure enough food to keep you alive. But more importantly, there was the second kind of sight. We call it insight. Insight gives us the ability to understand. Bartimaeus demonstrates insight when he identifies Jesus as son of David. While the crowd, which scholars think numbered perhaps in the hundreds, was probably impressed with the miracles and healings of Jesus, it's fair to say that from Mark's perspective, that Jesus' true identity was not well known. For Mark, the question of who Jesus actually is is hidden in Mark 6, verses 45 to, 40 to 52, the story of Jesus walking on the water. The disciples are terrified when they see him. They're not comforted that Jesus is coming to them. They think he's a ghost, or they think maybe he's even the devil. They're scared. And in Mark 8, 27, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of God. And then Jesus gives them strict instructions. Mark writes, then he charged them to tell no one about him. So they have this great revelation and they can't tell anybody. It's what the biblical scholars describe as the messianic secret in Mark. 
No one is to know until it's the proper time. Remember, Mark begins his gospel with a prophecy. No, no infancy narrative. He begins with chapter 1 and a, and a prophecy in chapter 2, and then he moves right on to John the Baptist. Mark does not describe Jesus' birth. There are no angels proclaiming his birth, no star guiding magi from the east, no slaughter of children in Bethlehem, and no flight to Egypt. Mark is concerned with Jesus being the Christ, the deliverer who would lead Israel not in a, in a coup against the Roman Empire and its monumental strength and tyranny, but against the sin that condemned people to death. The Christ would liberate them from the tyranny of the religious establishment who was more concerned with keeping the letter of the law than caring genuinely for the disadvantaged and outcast. Jesus, though the religious establishment tries to, the, its hardest to paint him as an insurrectionist, is not. He's not the new king to replace Caesar. When the religious establishment, scribes and Pharisees, take Jesus to Pilate and make that accusation, Pilate doesn't buy it. Though he realized that he was condemning an innocent man to death when he tried to wash his hands of the guilt, knowing what the Sadducees and the Pharisees would do, he consented to their wishes to crucify Jesus. Bartimaeus was what we might call an early adapter. When it comes to insight, Bartimaeus was far from blind. Even Jesus' closest followers really didn't understand until after the resurrection. In last week's text in Mark 10, 32, before they got to Jericho, Jesus took the 12 aside and told them what would happen. Verses 33 to 34, look, he said, we're going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priest and the legal experts. They'll condemn him, condemn him to death, and hand him over to the Gentiles. They will ridicule the Son of Man, spit on the Son of Man, torture the Son of Man, and kill the Son of Man. After three days, he will rise up. But the twelve didn't get it. Just before they get to Jericho, two of them, begin to question him with different kinds of questions. James and John ask a favor of Jesus. Uh, arrange it, they said, so that we will be awarded the highest places of honor in your glory, in your kingdom, some translations say. One on the right and one on the left. One on the right and one on the left. Jesus is somewhat amazed, according to Mark. Verse 38 says, you have no idea what you're asking. Now I can imagine Jesus saying, has it been this long that we've been together and you don't get it yet? Sometimes we just don't get it. They didn't get it at that point. Even though Jesus is so clear about the future, they still envision an earthly kingdom. They don't know how it's going to come, but it's pretty clear they don't expect the events of the next couple of days. When the going gets tough, Jesus hangs on the cross, giving his life for our sins and for the sins of humanity. The only one of the 12 that was there that day, caring for Jesus' mother, was John. Often I wonder, are we like blind, like blind Bartimaeus? Let me try this again. Are we like blind Bartimaeus? Or are we more like the disciples? who don't get who Jesus is and what his, he is teaching. The 12 and most of the crowd were blind to the truth of Jesus. They were happy to hear what Jesus was saying. They figured that Jesus was not addressing them though, but those in authority. It wasn't until after the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God descended on them, that they really got it. Until then, they were lost. They didn't get what Jesus was talking about. Oh, they were relieved after the resurrection. Jesus wasn't dead after all. He could still keep his promise, but after his ascension, there they were back in fear, huddled in that upper room waiting, gripped in fear about what to do next. 
And according to some gospel writers, after the resurrection, between the great resurrection and the, and the great commission, they went back to Galilee and did what they always did. Jesus found them fishing. Do we really understand what Jesus is saying to us? Are we ready to take up his cross and follow him? For most of us, we just dismiss the Sermon on the Mount. For instance, some of us uh, kind of deal, uh, for some of us it's just kind of ideal. We don't even believe it and don't want to try to fulfill it. It's just something that Jesus said. It was a teaching, but we could never live that way. But Jesus tells us to take care of the poor. And like the people of Jesus' day, many of our society don't want to be reminded of the poor in our midst. Remember those bell ringers I talked about earlier? They've been at it since 1891, when Salvation Army Captain Joseph McPhee used red kettles to increase donations to fund Christmas dinner for San Francisco's poor. But I remember, not so long ago, a KYW News Radio report about the Salvation Army bell ringers generating complaints of office workers who found the bell ringing offensive. It disturbed them in their work, and it reminded them that they had jobs that produced resources for them to live on, while others required a ministry started in London's poor East End in 1867 to sustain their lives. And in Matthew 6, 33 and 34, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus instructs us to serve God first and take each day at a time. In chapter 7, Jesus tells us in Eugene Peterson's translation, the message, don't pick on people. Don't jump on their failures. Criticize their faults unless you want the same treatment. Jesus is calling his followers to look at life differently. Differently than the rest of the world looks at it and differently than the world treats people. Welcome and care for the stranger and the foreigner. That's what happens to Bartimaeus that day outside of Jericho. Jesus heals him and changes his life. When we truly trust Jesus, our lives are changed too. Our worldview changes. We become more accepting and empathetic. We become more generous and less self-serving and self-centered and kinder to others. We see those beggars and genuinely care for them because they're our brothers and sisters. And they're saying to us, see us, see us. Don't keep us invisible, see us. That's what happens when we go to Jerusalem with Jesus and when we experience a sacrifice he made for us. It's transforming. We're called to be Jesus' ears and hands and mouth and feet, to care for those around us, even if it cost us our lives. Let's pray. Gracious healer, help us to see ourselves as others see us. Forgive us when we do not see others and their needs because we are so focused on ourselves. Help us to look in the mirror of your word so that we can understand the prejudices that surround us. Speak to our hearts and heal our sight that we can clearly be the path you lead us down. And, and we can see it. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Now may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.